A very good morning to everyone from me and from Luna. Good morning, church family. Hello, church family. Good morning, church family. Good morning, above our church. Good morning, above our church. Good morning, above our church family. Hello, above our church. Good morning, church family. Hi everyone! Hello, Hello Church family. family! Hello Above Bar Church! Good morning Above Bar! Hello Church Family! 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 Good morning Above Bar Church! Good morning Above Bar Church! Hello Above Bar Church! Good morning Above Bar Church Family! Hello Church Family! Good morning everyone and welcome to this morning's service. My name is Sophie. Whether it's your first time joining us today or if you've been around for a long time, it's great to have you with us. Recently, we have been looking at the story of the early church in Acts and today we're going to look at how God's people use God's word to teach, encourage and persuade others about the good news of Jesus. And why is it so important to share the good news of Jesus? Well, through the passages today, we are going to see that God's word is the truth, God's word is life-changing, and God's word is Jesus-centered. And we're also gonna hear from some people in our own church family who want to share their experience of this. Let's pray before we begin. Lord God, thank you that Psalm 119 says that your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. We pray that by your spirit, you would bring your word alive to us today and show us through Acts that your word is the truth, that it's life-changing and that it's Jesus-centered. Amen. Let's now sing our first song together. Without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt Stones move for good, 
for the Lamb had conquered death And the dead rose from their tombs And the angels stood in awe For the souls of all who'd come To the Father are restored And the church of Christ was born Then the Spirit lit the flame Now this gospel truth of old Shall not kneel, shall not faint By His blood and in His name In His freedom I am free For the love of Jesus Christ Who has resurrected me verse 10 to 15. As soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica. They received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. As a result, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. But when the Jews in Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the word of God at Berea, some of them went, some of them went there too, agitating the crowds and stirring them up. The believers immediately sent Paul to the coast, but Silas and Timothy stayed at Berea. Those who escorted Paul brought him to Athens and left with instructions for Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible. Thank you so much, uh, Pip, for reading the Bible for us. My name's Callum. I'm the head of Young Adult Ministry in Above Bar Church. If you're uh, new to the city or new to Above Bar and you're a young adult, you're a student, or maybe a new professional in the city, please do get in touch through the church website. We'd love to get to know you. Sophie said at the beginning of this service that we're looking in Acts at how the early Christian church used the Bible, used God's word, to teach, to encourage, and to persuade people about Jesus. And we'll be seeing here in Acts 17 and Acts 18, how the early Christians believed God's word is the truth, God's word is life-changing, and God's word is Jesus-centered. So first of all, God's word is the truth. And as we're looking at Acts 17, be thinking, what's the difference between uh, the Jews in Thessalonica and the Jews in Berea? What's the difference between the two groups? So Paul and other Christians are traveling around the Mediterranean world, sharing about Jesus. And they would go, first of all, to Jews. Uh, Paul and most of the early uh, first believers were Jews themselves. And they had in common, they believed that the old, what we now know as the Old Testament, uh, what was scripture to them, Genesis to Malachi, the first 39 books of the Bible was God's word. It was true. And so they would reason with the Jews, trying to show how Jesus fulfilled God's word fulfilled scripture. He was the one scripture was pointing to. Now, so first of all, we see, uh, if you look, chapter 17, verse 10, as soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. Why are they sending them away at night? Well, because if we look earlier in chapter 17, in verses one through nine, Paul was in Thessalonica. And some people came to believe 
that Jesus is God, that Jesus is the one that scripture points to. But it says in verse five, other Jews were jealous. So they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob and started a riot in the city. So that's why we see verse 10, Paul and Silas are getting out of Thessalonica. It's becoming unsafe. But carrying on, verse 11, as it says, the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. It's interesting, doesn't it? Isn't it? It says they were of more noble character because they were examining scripture every day to see if what Paul said was true. The difference between the Jews in Thessalonica and the Jews in Berea is the Jews in Berea were jealous. They let ulterior motives influence whether or or not they thought what Paul said was true. They didn't care. They were jealous. They drove him out. The Bereans didn't let, you know, preconceptions or anything like that influence what they thought of what Paul was saying about Jesus. They looked at scripture first and said, is what he's saying matching up with what the Bible says. That's the big difference. The Berean Jews were open-minded. They desired to know the truth. So they searched scripture to see if what Paul said was right. They didn't take first, oh, I I don't like this person, I'm jealous, or oh, I think he's a bit too conservative, or he's a bit too liberal, and then read that into the passage. No, they said, is what he's saying match up with scripture? They believed God's word is the truth. And the Bible says that because of that, they were of more noble character than the Thessalonican Jews. And this is a huge encouragement and challenge for us. If you're a Christian, if you're part of a Bar church, don't just take my word for it. Don't just take any teacher's word for it. Don't take a minister's word for it. Does what they say match up with what God's word says? What does the Bible say about this? Are you willing to be open-minded and look at the Bible for yourself and see, is it the truth? Now, this can be a challenge for some of us. Some of us find it really hard to read the Bible. We'd rather just hear what somebody else says the Bible's saying and then go with that. But we need to do the hard work of studying the Bible for ourselves not just taking it all uh, from someone else. And maybe if you'd like to study the Bible more, maybe you've never studied the Bible before, uh, I'd really recommend you try maybe something like Uncover Mark, which is designed for somebody who's never read the Bible before to study Mark's gospel, one of the accounts of Jesus's life for yourself. Or maybe you're a Christian, but you, you just struggle with it. Maybe ask somebody older in the church if they'd study with the Bible with you every so often. But you also might be thinking, well, I mean, why would I trust the Bible in the first place? And that's a question I love and I would love to talk about more, but we don't have the time. But I would say there are answers to that question. And one of our sent mission partners in the church, David Couchman, has an amazing website with answers to many objections and questions about why trust the Bible. And it's www.focus.org.uk. You should check it out. Or you might want to YouTube or look up the book by Amy or Ewing called Why Trust the Bible. God's word is the truth. Are you open to it like the Bereans? Are you willing to search for yourself in the Bible? Do you hold the Bible as ultimate authority above your own desires and preconceptions and even the teaching of your leaders? The Bible is our authority because it is God's word. If you are open to exploring the Bible and open to it being the truth, you might find like the Bereans that not only is God's word the truth, but God's word is also life-changing. Look at chapter 17, verse 12, the very next verse. 
As a result, as a result of them searching the scripture to see if what Paul said was true, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. So as they searched the scripture, they were also listening to what Paul said about Jesus. The message of Jesus is that we were all made for a purpose, and that is to know and love and worship God. That is our purpose in life. You have a purpose. I have a purpose. But we've utterly botched it. If this is us, and we're meant to know God with an open hand, we've turned away from him. We've, we've rebelled against him. We do what is wrong, and we don't do what is right. And it's called sin in the Bible. It's blocking us from relationship with God. And the message of Jesus that Paul was sharing with these uh, Thessalonica and Berean Jews was that God in Jesus took our sin, took the punishment we deserve on himself so we can have relationship with God. We can know him. We can be forgiven. We can have life now and forever in Jesus. Jesus takes our sin on himself. So as the Berean Jews studied God's word, and by the way, listen out for some of the different ways people respond to God's word. Listen out to some of the ways that people respond to God's word. As they studied God's word and they were searching for the truth and being open to what Paul had to say, they came to believe it was true. They came to believe Jesus had taken their sin, that they could have freedom if they turned from their sin and put their trust in Jesus. The Bible says anyone who is in Jesus is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. New life when we put our trust in Jesus. That's life changing. And they experience that through reading, through listening, through, through searching through God's word. God's word is powerful. It works. It can change us. It can give us, lead us to new life in Jesus. And this is actually one of the many reasons why I believe God's word is also the truth. Because throughout history and throughout so many people's lives in this church and in the world and in my own life, God's word changes people as they read it. It impacts them. They meet a living God in the pages, the 66 books of the Bible. So one of the reasons I believe, one of the reasons I believe God's word is the truth is because it is life-changing. So it's important for us, are we open to God's word? Are we listening? Are we willing to give God's word a chance to approach it, open-minded and read it? Is this the truth? Could this change my life? I would really encourage you, if you've never read the Bible before, try reading a gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Maybe start with Mark. It's the shortest and simplest in a way. And you can actually get Uncover Mark through the church if you contact the church office. There'll be more details about that later. But you might also be thinking, well, these are Jews in Acts 17. They already know uh, the scripture that was being talked about, Genesis to Malachi, the Old Testament. They already know it. But even if you don't, it also says in verse 12, as a result, many of them believed, as also did a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. They wouldn't have known the scripture as well. Whether you think you know scripture well or you don't know it at all, try reading God's word with a humble heart. It's the truth and it is life changing. But don't just take my word for it. Let's also hear this story from a member of Above Bar Church whose life has been changed as they've read God's word. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. I read this in 2017 before I was a, a Christian. And I realized as I read this that it was describing in great detail the crucifixion of 
Jesus. And the beginning of Psalm 22 that this is taken from is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So Jesus was pointing towards an account of his crucifixion written hundreds of years before it happened. And when I realized this, it gave me tremendous confidence in the truth of the Bible. And that is why I am now a Christian. Uh, so for me, it was when I had this realization that the creator who created this world created me and he knows me and he loves me. And so when we read about Jonah running miles away from God, God was still faithful. And when we read about the Israelites being rebellious and disobedient, God was so patient. And so when I, when I realized that Jesus died on that cross for my sin, that truth, that reality, uh, set me free inside all the guilt. Um, it was just set free because of Jesus. We're about to sing a song called, It's a Light and a Hammer. And it has these words near the end. You might want to look out for them as you sing. Know the name of Jesus Christ that makes us new. Know the Son of God, the Word whose word is true. Hold the power of the universe in your hand. Hold the words that shape the sky and sea and land. The King has given words to us to tell us what he's like. Open up your ears and let his spirit strike. It's a light and a hammer, it's a fire and a sword. It's the voice of our Father, the word of the Lord. The blade of the Spirit can cut to the soul. And God will use it to make us whole. Hear the news of the promised King who came to save. Hear the news of Jesus who rose from the grave. Our King has come to live on earth and rescue us from sin. Open up your mind and let His Spirit in. It's a light and a hammer, it's a fire and a sword It's the voice of our Father, the word of the Lord The blade of the Spirit can cut to the soul And God will use it to make us whole Know the name of Jesus Christ that makes us new Know the Son of God, the Word, whose Word is true. A King has spoken to us, so there is no place for pride. He gives us hearts of flesh and changes us inside. It's a light and a hammer, it's a fire and a sword. It's the voice of our Father, the Word of the Lord. Blade of the Spirit can cut to the soul, and God will use it to make us. It's a light and a hammer, it's a fire and a sword. It's the voice of our Father, the Word of the Lord. The blade of the Spirit can cut to the soul, and God will use it to make us whole. Acts 18, verse 23 to 28. After spending some time in Antioch, Paul set out from there and traveled from place to place throughout the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, 
They invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. When Apollos wanted to go to Achaia, the brothers and sisters encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. When he arrived, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed, but he vigorously refuted his Jewish opponents in public debate, proving from scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. Thanks again, Pip. So we've seen God's word is the truth. God's word is life changing. And finally, we see God's word is Jesus centered. The story continues and we're introduced to this guy, Apollos, and he seems quite smart. He knows scripture well, though he needs to be corrected by Priscilla and Aquila, which is fun to say. Try saying it three times fast. But Apollos, once he gets the story about Jesus completely, it says, did you see chapter 18 verses 27 and 28? When Apollos wanted to go to Achaia, the brothers and sisters encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. Now get this, when he arrived, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed. For he vigorously refuted his Jewish opponents in public debate, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. Now remember, we don't have the New Testament yet in the Bible. This is the Old Testament, the, script, the scriptures that Apollos is using to prove that Jesus is the Messiah. Messiah is the uh, anticipated king and savior. Well, how did he do that? How does he prove that Jesus is the Messiah? In the Old Testament, Jesus isn't around yet, is he? Well, God's word is Jesus-centered. The Bible is 66 books in one book. It's one book with one storyline and one hero, Jesus. The whole Bible points to him. And Jesus himself said that, actually, in Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, verses 25 to 27. After Jesus' resurrection, he's walking with two men. And they don't fully get it yet, this, this whole that Jesus is the rescuer, the savior, the Messiah. And he says to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, that scripture, he explained to them what he said, what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Can you imagine explaining how God's word talks all about himself? It's all about Jesus. Here's a video uh, by the Bible Project that shows a little bit more of how the Bible is all Jesus-centered. It's pointing and leading to one person, one Messiah, one Savior, Jesus. There's this crazy story at the beginning of the Bible. We have Adam and Eve, and they're in the Garden of Eden. And everything in this garden is great. It's exactly as it should be, except there's this one tree that they're told by God not to eat from because it's dangerous and it will kill them. So that's it. Uh, avoid this fruit tree and we're fine. Right. It seems pretty simple. But in this garden, there's a snake and it starts telling a different story. It says that if you eat of this tree, it's not going to kill you. In fact, it's going to make you become like God. And Adam and Eve, they believe the snake and they eat the fruit. And because of this, the goodness of the garden is tragically lost and evil and death enters into God's good world. Now, why is there a talking snake in the garden? I mean, this thing is a problem. Yeah, it's very strange. And even more strange is the fact that the Bible doesn't say why or how this thing even got there. It just presents the snake as this creature who's in rebellion against God and that wants to get other people to doubt God's goodness and lead them on a path towards death. And so whatever this snake is, it's the source of evil that pervades our world and our lives even still today. But there is some hope because right here in the story, God makes this really interesting promise to Adam and Eve. 
that someone is going to come in the future, a son of Eve, and this guy's going to come and he's going to crush the serpent's head and destroy evil at its source. However, during this battle, the serpent is going to bite this guy's heel. So it's like a mutual destruction. Yeah, it's this very strange but beautiful promise, and it's just left hanging there until the next key moment in the story when God singles out this guy named Abraham and says that through his family, goodness and blessing is going to be restored back to all of the nations of the world. And as we follow this family, we get to one of Abraham's great grandsons, this guy named Judah. And he receives this promise that a king is going to come from his line and that the whole world's going to follow this king and he's going to bring peace and harmony and there'll be lots of food and wine and milk and vineyards and it's going to be awesome. The first king that we meet from the line of Judah is a guy named King David. And he's a hero. Maybe he is the snake crusher. But it turns out that David is infected with the same evil as the rest of humanity. He never crushes the snake, just the opposite. However, God makes a promise to David that this king is going to eventually come from his line. But as you go on in the story, one by one, each generation of his sons, they're just total chumps. They give in to the snake, they choose evil, they go after money and sex and power and following other gods. Things get so bad that they run the nation of Israel right into the ground and the big bad empire of Babylon just takes them out. And so now there are no more kings to even fulfill this promise. So it seems like the whole plan is lost. But during these dark days, there's this crazy group of guys called prophets and they just kept talking about this coming king and reminding us of the promise that he'll come, he'll defeat evil, he'll restore the garden. Now, one specific prophet, Isaiah, he tells us more about why this king is bitten. Isaiah says that the promised king receives this wound because of humanity's evil and that it kills him. But then all of a sudden he comes back and Isaiah says it's because he suffered this wound that he can now become a source of healing to other people. But the Old Testament ends and the snake crushing king that everyone's been talking about never shows up. And this is why when the New Testament begins, it introduces us to Jesus of Nazareth, not as some random guy, but as someone who comes to fulfill these specific ancient promises. Yeah, we learn that he's from the line of David, Judah, and Abraham. And he goes around Israel announcing that the goodness of God's kingdom is here now. And he begins confronting the effects of evil on people by healing them, by forgiving them of their sins and evil. Many people are now believing that this is, in fact, the promised king. But Jesus began telling his closest followers that he was going to become king and bring peace by taking the full effect of humanity's evil into himself. The fatal snake bite wound. Exactly. And so it seems like the serpent wins. And this story actually would be a tragedy except for what happens next. Jesus rises from the dead. And now Jesus has the power over evil and death for himself. And so the rest of the New Testament is then making this claim that Jesus' power over evil and death has now become available to us to begin confronting the effects of evil in our lives. But even still, death and evil are a real problem in our world all around us. And so the story of the Bible ends by describing this future day when Jesus comes back and he finishes the job. He destroys the snake once and for all and he restores the goodness of the garden here on earth. The Bible is the truth. The Bible is life-changing. And the Bible is Jesus-centered. As a church, as a family, as a community above our church, we want to go deeper with God in his word, in the Bible. So let's try reading the Bible. But remember, it's Jesus-centered, not us-centered. So often for myself, I open the Bible and I'm kind of flipping around saying, God, just show me, give me something. Show me what I'm to do. Give me some encouragement. And it's not bad to want those things. But when we read the Bible first, we need to be asking, what does it say about God? Where do I see Jesus? And only then... In the light of that, 
What does this say about me? What does this say? What does this mean for me? What do I need to do in the light of what it says about God, in the light of what it says about Jesus? As a church, let's go deeper in God's word. Maybe as a family, you could read Mark's gospel at dinner time, or maybe if you're a young adult or youth, maybe you could um, either ask somebody, a staff in church to connect you or ask somebody you know who's older in the church to study the Bible with you, maybe once a fortnight or something. And maybe if you've never really read the Bible or given it a go with an open mind or haven't for a long time, Maybe you'd like to read an account of Jesus's life for yourself. Why not read Mark's gospel for yourself and ask, what does this say about Jesus? Who is Jesus? And what does that mean for me? Above our church, let's go deeper with God. Let's hold it up, the Bible, as the truth. And let's search it diligently. Let's go deeper and help other people go deeper and experience the life-changing gospel of Jesus's grace. And through it all, let's see Jesus and worship him. Sound of your grace.
our service is now coming to an end. And I hope that you feel encouraged to take on the example of the early church and go out with boldness sharing God's word. If you don't know where to start with this, then Uncover Mark is a great resource to use to open up God's word with people around us who don't yet know Jesus. It's a resource that has been designed specifically to discover Jesus through the book of Mark. As always, if there's anything that you would like prayer about today, then please get in contact with the prayer team. The details are now on screen. So you can contact, you can text that number and someone will be really happy to pray with you after this service. Preach and Pray is happening today at 4 p.m. online and the prayer meeting is happening on Zoom this evening at half seven and the details for both of those can be found in the description box of this video. Thank you very much for joining us today and let's just pray to close. Thank you, Father, that your word is alive and has the power to transform our lives. Thank you that it reveals to us who Jesus is and I pray that you would give us boldness and confidence by your spirit to share the life-changing power of knowing Jesus with people around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I vividly remember the last time that I spoke in a service in our building at Above Bar. I was speaking on our vision to serve and reach the city of Southampton, something I'm really passionate about. But as I sat down, I remember wondering to myself how long it would be before we met in this way again. And sure enough, just a few days later, lockdown arrived. That was uh, over six months ago. And it's actually been amazing to me to, to see the way in which the church has been able to keep functioning and keep connected through online technology. And really stunning to see that vision to serve and reach the city of Southampton continuing to move forward. Uh, through Love Southampton and, and, and through the work of, of our church, even though we had to close our building down. It's amazing all that God has done. But of course, not meeting face to face has been hard. It's been hard for people who felt isolated. It's been hard for, for families. I think it's been hard for all of us in various ways. And to be honest, that shouldn't surprise us, should it? The Bible encourages us not to give up meeting together. It's, it's important. It's part of our spiritual lives that we do that. And from the earliest days, Christians, especially Christians in cities, have thrived when they've both met in small local home-based groups and gathered together in larger meetings from across the city. Both are important. And we've really missed those opportunities to connect more widely with other people in worship. But the good news is that that is now beginning to change. Uh, over the next few days, we are setting out on a new journey together as a church in which it's going to start to become possible for us to meet together once again, for those who feel ready for that just now. In fact, the journey will begin this Sunday on our east site, where over 51 people have already signed uh, in for a, a service of all age worship at the Woodlands Community College. We're really looking forward to that. And then the following week on the 11th of October, we're really looking forward to having people worshiping together on our city center sites uh, with uh, two 50 minutes accessible, all age sensitive services in the morning, 1915, 1115, uh, groups for reception to year two, years three to six, and years seven to nine running alongside those services and then more to life meeting at two o'clock in the afternoon. So that's from the 11th of October. We understand that this isn't the right time for everyone to begin face-to-face -face meetings. And it's really important at this time for us as a church family that we understand and honor and respect each other in the different decisions that we're making. So it's really important that we will continue to be able to watch church online. Uh, the 9.15 service will be live streamed each week and then you can watch it throughout the day. And we'll continue with Preach and Pray uh, from four o'clock and Zoom prayer at 7.30 in the evening. Still, the survey that we recently did shows us that somewhere between a half and two thirds of us do feel ready to return to face-to-face -face services. And the survey also tells us that we're very keen for as many as possible of our children and young people to be able to uh, have some face-to-face -face groups beginning again. 
The, uh, the COVID guidelines mean that our capacity in the building is limited to about 100 people booked in to each service. But as we've done the, uh, the thinking about it, the good news is we believe we can make this work safely. If those who choose to attend register to come every other week and then watch online with others in the weeks in between. So essentially, those who are planning to come will need to choose a time slot, 9.15 or 11.15, and a week slot will have kind of A weeks and B weeks, and then register themselves and their children and young people, if, uh, if they have them in their household, register them for those slots and will allocate spaces basically on a first come, first serve basis. To make this work, we will all need to work together and we'll need to be a bit flexible and yes, patient with each other. There will be things that go wrong that we have to iron out, that's okay. And it's gonna need new people to step up to volunteer in some of the roles because some of the people who volunteered in the past won't yet be able to come back to the building. But most of all, it really needs all of us to pray. Whether we're gonna to come to the building or whether we're gonna to continue to watch online. Prayer is so important right now for our health and life as a church. Now, of course, we don't know how the restrictions may change in the months ahead, and we'll keep a close eye on them. But I want to say I'm really excited about this journey, and I think it's time for us to get started. So as we do, let's stick together, let's love each other well, and let's pray for God to do a new thing among us. Hello church family, my name is Gerhild, I'm part of the church staff team and on behalf of the team, I welcome you back to Sunday services in our church building. It's so nice to see you. We are taking you on a brief tour to explain how things are different for now and how it all works. So if you'd like to join us for a Sunday service in the building, then please register and get a ticket during the week before. You should have received instructions on how to do this. If you haven't, you can go to our website to find out or find the church office. Please, bring a suitable face covering, unless you're exempted for medical reasons. Make sure that you don't have any symptoms, such as a temperature or a persistent dry cough. Arrive at the main entrance to the church building well in time. It will take a bit longer now for everyone to enter safely. The doors will open 15 minutes before the service and close soon after the service has started. Rest assured that we have prepared for you and that we have cleaned everything to the required standard. You will of course be greeted by the First Impressions team and asked if you booked a ticket. You will also be reminded to put on your face covering. As we'll be wearing face masks, we have set the seats at a distance of one and a half meters in line with the one meter plus government guidance and other mitigations. We ask that you leave a safe distance of one and a half meters between you and others at all times. That might mean you'll have to wait for a little while before you can enter the building. But please come inside now and use the sanitizing stations at the bottom of the stairs. We have put up posters with the NHS Test and Trace QR code. If you have got the NHS Test and Trace app on your device, please scan the QR code. This will also support our track and trace system. If you use the lift, only share it with people from your own household. Once you've reached the first floor landing, one of our first impressions team will ask you your name and the number of people in your household to confirm that you have registered. Now, walk through the lounge to the entrance of the auditorium. Please note that at this time, the lounge is closed and not open for social interaction. You will miss our refreshments and the friendly welcome desk team, but we hope it won't be long before we can bring both back for you to enjoy. Our First Impressions host will welcome you and guide you to the next available seat or seats. Please follow the instructions as they will make sure that you sit at a safe distance from the next person. 
People from one household can of course sit next to each other. Please stay in your seat throughout the service if at all possible. When the service has finished, please leave row by row from the back. Always leave a safe social distance of one and a half meters between you and the next person if they are not from your own household. The Friendly First Impressions team will help you. Please use the sanitizing station again at the bottom of the stairs before you leave the building. For your own safety, we recommend that you do not use the toilets in the building. If you need our facilities, the lounge toilets and second floor landing toilets will be open. The lounge toilets will be limited to two people at any one time. Please use the sanitizing station before and after. Thank you so much for watching. Let's all do our best to look out for and protect each other. And we very much look forward to welcoming you back.